My name is Sean Domigal Goldman. I'm a research space scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And Sean, are we alone? Well, I don't know. What's, what's exciting to me is that that's a question we've been asking for a long time. And in our lifetime, we're going to turn that into a testable hypothesis. And that's cool. When I asked you the question, are we alone, yeah. what did you understand by the word we? Biosphere. The biosphere. Yeah. Half the people I talk to think we humans, and half the think, you know, all life on Earth. But yeah. you're, a, you're a biosphere kind of guy. I think of the aggregate uh, that life presents on Earth as we. Is that a more in interesting question to you than are we humans alone in the universe? I think they're both interesting. I think the search for biospheres is one that we can probe more directly in our scientific lifetimes with the scientific method. Uh, we can actually do both. Uh, uh, and actually, a better way to phrase it is that we can... The stuff I work on is more focused on the we as a biosphere. Um, and that's partially because that's what you need to build space telescopes to do, which is one of the things I work on at NASA. They're both compelling. Uh, what, what, wait, 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 different stop, terms. time out. Yeah. What, why is our we humans alone in the universe compelling if we know we're not alone on Earth? Um, it would be compelling if we found out that we weren't alone, right? Is, I, are, I'm aren't not we, misunderstanding the question. There, there are many other life forms on Earth. Oh, yeah. Therefore, humans are not alone yes. on Earth. Therefore, we're not alone in the universe. So the question doesn't make any sense. Uh, un unless the question is, are there other advanced, intelligent, uh, edX-making life forms elsewhere? Okay, so then uh, we are alone on Earth. <laughs> well, we as a biosphere uh -huh. are alone uh -huh. so far. Um, we as an organism are certainly not alone. We as an intelligent uh, organism uh, in the, in the cosmos thus far are alone. That's the way I would phrase it. Okay. And, and I think uh, looking for other organisms that are relatively like us in that intelligent advanced, you know, and I know those are, those are weighted words, in that sense, um, that is a compelling search, although it's not the, the search that I participate in or think about most of my days. So if we find microbes in the plumes of Enceladus, we would no longer be alone? By, by my thinking, that's correct, yeah. Because I think, again, I think we as a biosphere, and then that would constitute another biosphere. But a I, lot of people don't care about microbes, and they say, I'm still alone. I can't talk to those guys. Therefore, I'm still alone. They should care about microbes because a <laughs> large should. part of those people are <laughs> microbes, right? So They've when got you, a microbiome. When, you, in when them. you tell these people you should care, does that work? I think so. Because, because the questions are not uncorrelated. You know, if we find life on Europa, if we find ancient evidence of life on Mars, if or existing life on Mars, if we find evidence of life that might not be advanced or intelligent or communicating on an exoplanet, those things would make the presence or likelihood, the presence of advanced intelligent communicating life uh, more likely beyond our solar system. So they're not uncorrelated questions. Even if all you care about are the aliens you see in Hollywood movies, you care about microbes on Enceladus. Really? I think so. So what fraction of the world's population cares about microbes on Enceladus? Uh, I haven't done the survey. What do you think? Uh, I think most people at a fundamental level. Okay. Because of that higher level question, right? Uh -huh. um, it, it speaks to our place in the cosmos. Whether, however you define the we, are we alone is a first order question that I think people are profoundly interested, or are, are inherently interested in. Profoundly and different from inherently changed. Uh, was it, what, uh, that was my next question. Yeah. Is the question, are we alone, an important one? I think so. Because? Because it speaks to our, uh, again, it, for either version of the word we, right? So actually, let me, let me break this down. For the we as, like a, as, a, as a, a, a species that can build stuff, um, knowing whether or not we're the only one, I think is, is fascinating. Build stuff not like beaver dams or bird's nests. Sure. Uh, more, more complex than that, yeah. But even, even beaver dams and bird's nests, right? Um, there's, it'd be hard to probe the complexity of life or the, 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 the life that is multicellular and maybe can build stuff like, like bird's nests and beaver dams, but not sending messages across interstellar space. I, I haven't seen the test that actually gets at that specific level of complexity. Um, but however you define we, knowing whether or not um, there are other biospheres or other uh, uh, organisms out in the universe that are, let's just say, self-aware, um, 
those, those two questions separately and independently, I think, are both interesting to most people. You said the word self-aware, and it makes yeah. me think of Carl Sagan. I think, to paraphrase him, he said something like, uh, we are the way the universe has become aware of itself. Right. What do you, what do you think of that? I think that's cool. <laughs> so, so I know that people who are really self-conscious aren't able to dance very much because they're so self-conscious they, they're yeah. afraid. Yeah. And, but and that can be in, in, uh, change on, in the environmental context, right? Well, explain. Uh, you know, if I'm with my four-year-old daughter, uh -huh. I might be willing to dance more than if I was like in a room full of strangers. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, the, uh, I guess the point I was trying to make is that self-consciousness is not necessarily a, a great thing. And, uh, sure. But Carl was obviously implying that it was. Right. You think it is. I think the fact that I think and you think and the people watching this video think and that us as an organism having that capacity um, and being at least an end member of organisms on our planet in that capacity um, is scientifically interesting. And, and knowing whether or not there are other end member organisms out there in the cosmos, to me, is an interesting scientific, but also an interesting philosophical question. Okay, let me just be more specific. If yeah. humans have World War Three, Four, and Five, we marginalize ourselves like uh, as Planet of the Apes. Yeah. How long do we have to wait before? Is there an intelligence niche towards which other creatures will ev evolve? You think? Potentially, uh, that's an experiment I'd rather not conduct. Um, I, I, but but the other way to conduct it is to look for those signs elsewhere, right? The the peaceful way <laughs> to do that experiment is is to see if these kinds of organisms have cropped up on other worlds that have the conditions that would allow for it. I would argue that the experiments have already been run and they're called New Zealand and South America and Madagascar in which the, the intelligence niche did not, it wasn't a convergent feature. Fair enough. And what do you think of that? It's possible, but, but you know, we're still dealing with small sample size, right? We Even are. taking that into account. We are. Sample size of what, three? Maybe seven if you argue per continent. Now, so. So people are interested in, I guess this, there's a scientific story of Genesis where they have the Big Bang and the origin of the universe, the origin of the Earth, the origin of humanity. Yeah. These are all kind of origin stories that are pretty fundamental. Yeah. And uh, we have a scientific version of that now, mm -hmm. and it's getting better and better. Does that make you a better person to know what your history is? Because some people don't care about history, and other people say, oh, this is great, I know about history, and you know, it gives me a perspective that I find useful. Other people say, hey, what's for dinner? So, you know, better person is... is uh is, a, is an interesting metric for it. I, you know, I think as a society, the more we know about the universe we live in, the better off we are. Uh, and, and we've been talking mostly about like, you know, are people fundamentally interested in the question? But there's another reason why this is actually a good thing for us to be doing. Um, I believe that we understand the way our, we interact with our planet better because of the context that we've placed our planet within by explorations of other planets in the solar system. I think it's also going to expand in terms of our ability to, um, to, to put ourselves in a context once we further expand our observations, right? So, so right now we, we know a lot about Earth systems processes, right? We know about atmospheric chemistry, we know about geophysics, we know about atmospheric escape and geochemistry, in part because of the studies we've done of other worlds in our solar system. But none of those other worlds so far as we know have global biospheres. And so there's one component for which we have only a single data point still, which is uh, the, the interactions of a planet with its biosphere. The best we can do for understanding that better today is to go back through Earth history and look at other versions of Earth as the biosphere and the planet have interacted. I want to live in a world, on, on, on our world, 30 years from now, where we have other examples of biospheres so we can better understand how a biosphere and its planet interact. I think that'll actually have some... Uh, specific lessons for us that we could apply as a, as a society. So would I, would I be a better, you know, a better person for having known you know, how biospheres and planets interact? Uh, maybe not on the individual level, but, but maybe in the aggregate, if we understand better how to, for example, manage a climate system as a result. So the unexamined life is not worth living? <laughs> I think the examined life is more worth, more <laughs> okay. worth living. Less worth living. Uh, what do you know about aliens? Uh, nothing. Have you ever seen one? No. Been abducted by one? Uh, no. Nope. Ever been visited by aliens in your dreams? No. Uh, you have a favorite alien movie? Oh, um, 
prob you know, I've, I've, I've been a Star Wars fan my whole Star life. Star Wars. Yeah. Okay. Star Wars. Uh, although there's a huge caveat to all my notes. Yeah. I like, yeah, Wookiees are cool. Uh, huge caveat to everything I just said. If, if aliens exist, then I know lots of aliens from their perspective. How's that? Well, you're an alien from their perspective. Oh, so I see. I. I see. Okay. Do you think we're living in a simulation from some that made by some advanced civilization? No, but I can't prove it. And to a certain extent, this is, a, I was actually a double major in philosophy in my first year of college, and we got to the point where we could we proved we couldn't prove anything. Oh, you proved that you couldn't prove that sounds and, and then interesting. The, and then I just didn't want to be a philosophy major anymore. Right, and, and you changed the <laughs> math, like, right? <laughs> okay. Um, do you, if I gave you a hundred billion dollars with the caveat you have to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone? How would you spend it? Uh, I'd spend it. A hundred billion's a lot. Yeah. Um, but we could do a lot with that. I would uh, send a rover to Mars to collect samples, bring them back home. I would send something through the plumes of Europa to collect a sample, and bring it back home, or, or land on Europa and, and get down to the, the oceans there. Uh, and I'd build a giant space telescope and, and look for signs of life on planets around other stars. Um, and, and I do all three. I don't lean into one because if I've got a, a larger budget, like $100 billion, I think I can probably do all three. And, and I think the things we learn from a coordinated search for life, like, like, a, like it, you know, in that, in that sense, um, is greater than we'd learn from doing a detailed search on just one location. No money for SETI? Oh, yeah, I do SETI as well. But actually, you know, what's interesting about that is, is, the stu is most of the proposals to do SETI, in terms of their cost, are, are lower than the things I mentioned in terms of building spacecraft to send uh, to space, no to, to other planets. No right. money to send postage stamps to Alpha Centauri? Again, sh we can do that. Um, oh, you mean like a flyby? Yeah. Like a, like, wow. um, I think we do that, personally, I think we do that once we know, once we know the address to send things to. So, you know, doing a flyby to a star is good. Doing a flyby to a star with a, with a known planet is better. Better than that is doing a flyby to a planet for which we've got some degree of chemical and ideally uh, biological characterization uh, having been done already. So, you know, if we do a space telescope and it finds evidence of life, um, you know, we can talk about confidence levels, but if we, if we find evidence of biosignatures on one of these planets around another star, to me that's at the point where you think about doing the flyby and sending the postage, postage stamp. No money for microscopes to look for nano alien spacecraft in this room. Oh I'll, yeah. So so, uh, what I explained to you was like the, the big budget items that would that would consume most of that hundred billion dollars okay. to assess the data from Mars or Europa or Enceladus or exoplanets. You actually need a huge scientific community. Uh, that still costs a lot of money, right? Millions of dollars, uh, maybe in the you know a bit one or two billion dollars a year range. But that's not. That's not going to be on the same size cost-wise as as the the hardware you're you're sending out to space. So the electro, I mean, you would spend some money with, on electro microscopes to look for nano aliens in this room, spacecraft from an advanced civilization that are nano. Oh, I, that's probably not where I'd I'd put my own investment. None um, of your hundred billion. Probably not. How about you've seen the movie The You True know, actually, you know what I do? I would do what we do. Which is, you know, I would have a research program here on Earth, oh. and and I would have people propose, oh. write proposals for like, you know, I think, you know, Sh Sean I'm, Templeton. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, if hey, if you give me the hundred billion dollars, <laughs> okay. um, you know, I'm act I probably would spin up a, a, a panel to do. One person, res one Indian student, responded that he would spend it on poverty reduction programs because if we're going to detect aliens, we have to stay alive, and if we don't reduce economic inequality in our yeah. society, then we'll probably go extinct and self-destroy. Yeah. Well, there's something else to that too. Is that the the more people we pull up out of poverty, the greater diversity of brains we have uh, coming to the problem. And, and I think that's to the net benefit so of So what fraction of your money would you spend on that? Oh, gosh. That's a, that's a question for an economist. I really okay. don't. I asked another person. He said, I'd put, bury the money until we knew what we were doing. What do you think of that? No, I, I don't agree with that. <laughs> okay. Be because, <laughs> because the only way you get to know what we're doing better is by spending money on somebody right. somewhere. Now, you've seen the movie The it. Truman Show. Uh, yeah, it's been a while, but I have, yeah. You think uh, we're living inside of an alien? No. 
you know, they have neurons in your head that don't know that they're in your brain. Yeah, I've seen a matrix too. Okay, so I mean, and you don't think that we there's a possibility that we could be inside of an alien? Oh, I, I think it's possible, and I can't disprove that we're not. You sailed to the boundary, right? That's yeah, what he did. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. But you know, there's a certain extent to which the answer to that question is unprobable, right? Um, you sail to the boundary until you run into it. Well, that question specifically, you could sail to the boundary until you run into well, it. Well, how would a neuron figure out it's inside your head? Exactly. It would, it would be like, okay, i got to move around right. here. To see, okay. Yeah. There's no, way, there's no test outside of escaping the matrix to know that you're in the matrix. Bang into the wall. <laughs> yeah, bang There's an the edge wall. to this reality. And, uh, and until, we, you know, until someone escapes the matrix and then tells us or bangs into that wall, I think it doesn't influence how I, uh, how I operate on the day-to-day. Because there's no experiment other I can do other than banging into the wall. That a lot of people talk about life, and yeah. uh, you've mentioned things life a few times. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you know what life is? No, I think we'll know better once we find it or don't. So you don't think we need Elsewhere. a definition for life to proceed operationally? I, I think it's good to have an operational one, but I don't think we should assume that our operational definition is the actual one. Okay, can you go? Look? I, but I don't hear anybody, there. everybody's looking for life, they're not looking for semi-life. Like viruses, for example? Or well, Yeah, or I don't know, I guess they've already found life if life is a storm on Jupiter. So I th- one thing I think the astrobiology community is starting to do is think about life as a totality of processes uh, inside a planetary environment. Um, and uh, one example of this is thinking about how it impacts the environment itself. And, and, and I'm talking about now, this isn't necessarily a definition, but it gets closer to one. Well, and let me, and, and let me the, stop you there, let me stop yeah, you there, because yeah. a lot of people think that that's crazy to look for a life in a planetary context because most other life forms, they imagine that life on a planetary context evolves and then becomes inorganic and then just goes through space and is no longer connected to its host planet, and that's the Possibly. most likely or abundant life in the universe. And if that's the case, then we're looking in the wrong places if we are looking on our planets. Yep. So Louvois would be looking in the wrong place, your yep. favorite telescope. Right. So is there a way to look for aliens that are not associated with uh, planets? I have Inorganic aliens? So I haven't, I haven't been thinking about that a lot. I haven't thought of any ways. But if somebody thinks of a way we could detect such life and, and we could build a telescope to go look for it, that's at the point where we start thinking about it. Hmm. Yeah. I, and you know the other part to this is that that story kind of presumes a l- I don't want to say a lot, but it presumes more than just um, global biospheres existing. Um, I th- to me, unless you unless the hypothesis is that you know you've got some gray goo that's consuming all the biospheres out there, and then I would question why are we here. Um, Unless, unless you're presuming that that, that that sort of more advanced non-planet-based life is um, consuming the planet-based life or destroying it somehow, I'd, a prerequisite for that occurring is to have that planetary home for the life to have first evolve and advance in, uh, in the first place. Um, so finding that, to me, seems to be a prerequisite for the, the more advanced non-planet-bound life. SETI's, More advanced. SETI people sometimes debate whether we should or should not, well, should we just listen or should we also transmit? Stephen Hawking mm-hmm. famously said, oh, we should keep our head down. Yeah. The reason he said that, you know, about because of the history of genocide among human tribes. Right. It, I'm not sure whether that's applicable or not, but there's a tremendous time scale between what we expect the average age of these advanced civilizations to be in ours. Yeah. In other words, it's like two billion years or something, and that's yep. like our ancestors two billion years was uh, an amoeba. We don't care about amoebas, we don't talk to them, It would be, and, and we could kill them without even thinking about it. So I guess that's the type of scenario he's afraid of. Do you share those concerns? I don't, I don't place a high priority on those concerns, but I, I don't think they're completely unwarranted either. Um, I think, you know, I'm on two different mission studies that are talking about ways to find evidence of life spectroscopically across interstellar space where that other, the life on that other planet is not intentionally sending a signal. What that implies is that we, are, we, we think we have the technologies today, or at least will in the next five to 10 years, to build a telescope that will find life on another, on a planet around another star. 
What I, we don't, won't have in the next 10 years is the technology to rapidly move from here to another star system. You know, we could send, we could send a cell phone there, like some postage stamp or something like that, but we don't, we, especially if we're talking about like inter, interstellar <laughs> warfare type stuff, um, we don't know how to do that. Like I don't even think we've written down the basic equations of how to do that, um, at least not at a reasonable energy cost. Um, so to me, um, if, a, if another alien species has the ability to get here and do something about our presence, I think it's, it, it's likely that they already know we exist. And in this case, at, at the very least, they know that we as a biosphere exist, if not we as an intelligent um, communicating civilization. Well, do you think dark energy and vacuum fluctuations or dark matter have anything to do with aliens? Do you think aliens could be the dark matter? I haven't heard any. I have not heard that hypothesis laid out. Okay. I, don't, I don't know how that, how that would work, to be honest. Okay. Um, you think stars are alive? The stars fit certain definitions of life. Um, but you're not looking for them because we've already found them. They're not the kind of life that we're looking for, if they are alive. Okay. I, I, the way I think about it, no, stars aren't alive. Okay. All right. Uh, do you have a favorite? Well, so, by the way, yes. on the stars thing, this yeah. is actually kind of the, this is why operational definitions of life really are just operational, right? Like, like there are things that are clearly alive that aren't going to fit some definitions of life and things that most people would say are not alive, not just stars, but minerals and fire and stuff like that, that would fit many definitions of life, um, even though most people would say, yeah, that's not life. Um, and that's why it's important that we, if we have these operational definitions, we don't adhere so strictly to them um, that we assume that they are some uh, threshold that you were either alive or not based on an operational definition that is in, in turn based on what we have found and not found thus far. Right. But, but most of the discussion in the conference we just listened to was biotic, abiotic, biotic, abiotic, yeah. as if there was no gray area. There might be. There might be. Do you think there is? It's, I, th I think there, there most likely is, at least in chemical space, in terms of you, you, have, you have a chemical system that has complexity to it and maybe even has some selection but has not crossed whatever threshold we objectively decide is life. Um, th the issue with that is, is as because there's two, there's two ways to ask a lot of these questions. One is very philosophical and the other is, is more scientific in terms of designing a test for the hypothesis, right? So if we turn, there's a gray area between living and non-living um, into a testable hypothesis. The test in that case is probably more going to happen in a chemistry labor laboratory than it will with me building a, a helping build a space telescope. Because um, I don't know what the global signature of kind of alive is. In your view, is the RNA world a viral world? Yeah, you should ask an original okay. question. Okay. Have you seen the movie Contact? Sure, yeah. I have. In the movie several times, it says, are we alone? And the answer comes back, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. Yep. What do you think of that? I think that's an awesome hypothesis. That's one we want to test. So you think that if there are no life elsewhere, it's a waste of space? Uh, I, think the <laughs> I think the broader implication of uh, there's a lot of space and a lot of stars out there, and now we know a lot of planets out there, and mm -hmm. therefore there's probably life, that's the hypothesis we could test. No, but right. the question is, uh, if we are alone, then it's a waste of right. space. Would that's not a test of all hypothesis. That's not. No, I don't think so. Well, it's kind of a subjective feeling exactly. about whether you should yeah. or should not invade the, or colonize right. the, the world. Right. And if you did test it, it'd be through like a survey, not through a space okay. telescope. Also in the movie Contact, yep. when Jodie Foster first finds this message, the military move in and the military say, look at that, these, are, these architectural designs. They're probably going to build. You're supposed to build something, and they'll destroy us. So let's not even build it. Yeah, like a Trojan so, horse. Yeah. So a couple, some people think that we shouldn't even listen because of that. What do you think? It's like an anti-SETI argument. There. I guess there's two parts to this. One is, the the bad side of that presumes we are going to do what we're told. We're going to follow the instructions, so to speak. Um, which is different than just receiving the message in the first place. Um, so you think that we can Unless the technology is so easy to construct. How about you could bring the Trojan horse into the, into the city but n keep a watch on it? Yeah, you could do that too. Okay. 
don't let the Greeks out. Or, 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 you know, assess what it is that you're making before you make it. Okay, now I've been talking to the rational side of your brain. I'd like to contact your emotional side. So could This has been the rational side? That's been your rational side. So you close <laughs> your eyes, All right. take a deep breath, and the question is, what kind of aliens would you like to find? Hmm. Something different. Something different. Yeah. Different. Yeah. Because surprises are what educate us. That sounds like a rational, intellectual argument rather than an emotional one. Uh, what, can, okay. what can I do? It's Friday. It's Friday. It's hard to let my inner spot. <laughs> inner spot. Choke down my inner spot. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's see. I think I've got. Are we? Alone? I want them to be nice. Nice. You know, like different but nice. You mean talk to them? That doesn't sound like a microbe. Microbes. Are, microbes nice. A virus is nice. Well, this is why I said different. A different. Oh, well. I mean, if you're asking me what, you know. Uh, I want them to be different because then we'll learn something from them regardless of whether or not we communicate with them. We'll learn something regardless of whether they're different. So True, yeah. I, although I would guess we'd learn more if they were different. But Okay, so... I want to be surprised. Okay, you say... I really do. Okay, you want to be surprised. Well, won't you be surprised if they're the same or you'll be surprised if they're different, right? <laughs> so you're always surprised. So you win-win. Fair point. <laughs> okay. I am expecting something different, so that is a good point. Okay. Um, are we alone? I don't know. If there is life elsewhere, yeah. do you think that it would evolve into human-like intelligence? Technological. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Is that question of any interest to you? Yeah. Because? I want to know our place in the cosmos, and I think that helps define it. Um, a lot of t several times I've accused SETI searchers of looking for human beings or looking yeah. for God. Yeah. And uh, what do you think of those accusations? Uh, I think any search we do, whether it's SETI or whether it's the search for biospheres, is, is going to be biased by our experiences on our home planet, including with other, including with ourselves, but also including with our biosphere and its it the way it's changed over time. Okay. So, and that's a tough problem to get around. Of course, yeah. So, so, so. Yeah. So, are we alone? I don't know. You know what? What? Ask me in thirty years. <laughs> okay. I'm serious. I, I will that's ask, the point. I will ask you in thirty years.